welcoming you. Um, greetings, my friends from all over the world, um, joining us from places like Lyon, France and Vancouver, uh, all across the United States and Canada. And we're so excited to have you here for our eighth Empower and Educate and Empower webinar on a very special topic today, the topic of Reiki for cancer care. And I'm really excited to learn about this healing holistic system and how it can benefit our rare community. So just a reminder, well, I'll say my name is Anne and I am the IWMF's wellness program coordinator. And I just wanna remind you that these free wellness webinars are brought to you by the IWMF's wellness program, which is informed and funded by the Waldenstrom's community. That's you and your supporters. So these complementary and integrative practices are to be used in conjunction with standard medical treatment, along with the approval of your doctor. And I'm really um, grateful to our home team staff support, Donna, who is here today to help us manage the group. So just a reminder to please stay muted unless we invite you to unmute during the question and answer period. Um, we'll have uh, a period of time for question and answer where you can type your question into the chat and then funnel it to me. And then perhaps way at the very, very end, we'll stop the recording. We might have a little more time there as well. So um, please feel free to type any messages into the chat that you would like me to ask Sharon during that period, and I'll do my best to address them. All right, today it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Sharon Rivet, sometimes pronounced Rive, wherever she is, maybe in Canada, she'll be called Rive, or in Lyon, France, she'll be called Sharon Rive. Um, Sharon is a really integral part of our IWMF organization. I'm going to embarrass her a little bit here. She volunteers for the Ed Planning Committee, Ed Forum Planning Committee. She's a support group leader, regional contact. She's an ambassador to Lymphoma Research Foundation and Beijing Patient Advocacy Council, and she works um, helping us out with the torch as well. She's also somebody who has firsthand experience having Wallenstroms. She was diagnosed in 2018, and she is knowledgeable and experienced in the healing arts. She's a certified Reiki master teacher and also a certified Ayurvedic yoga teacher who has been practicing yoga for over 30 years with additional training in yoga therapy. So that enables her to tailor things for specific populations. And Sharon, I hope you'll, let, um, I hope you'll allow me to say this, that she is a proponent of utilizing integrative and complementary therapies to support whole person well-being. As such, as part of her private practice, Sharon shares Reiki with her clients, both near and far. And that is a really cool thing we're going to be learning about today, distance Reiki. Um, she shares this to help promote relaxation and healing. And today, Sharon is going to share some of the Reiki tools she's used to support herself through her treatment and for the ups and downs of having Wallace drops. We are so lucky to have you here today, Sharon. Thank you so much for dedicating your time to our group. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I'm really excited to share uh, this Reiki background and some exercises that we'll do together so that you can walk away with some um, ways to move your energy. And we'll do a brief history because I think it's important to know where Reiki came from and um, talk about how it could benefit you and certainly how it benefit me when I was going through treatment. But I also continue to practice uh, Reiki and injury work on myself. So. I'd like to start out with an energy exercise. It's called the shower of light. And it is a way for either you're a Reiki master or just want to move energy around. Um, it's a way to bring energy within and without. 
So um, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can do it standing. You can do it sitting. I'll stand so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, and before we get going, because I know from myself when I was in treatment and I had a port, it was uh, very tender. So I had a hard time lifting my arms over my head. So you just have to gauge for yourself where it's comfortable. If you can't lift your arms, just bring them to heart center. You'll still get the effect because you'll hear me throughout this whole time we have together. It's about the intention, the intention of using energy to help us relax and rejuvenate. So I will show you um, the shower of light. Well, I'll show you standing, so I'll move back and I'll talk a little louder here. So in the shower of light, you're just standing or sitting, your palms turned up towards the sky, towards the universe. And if you're bringing your hands all the way up, gather all the energy around you, and then just reach towards the sky and imagine energy is flowing in through your fingers and then traveling all through your body. And bringing palms together. You're going to bring your palm to the crown of your head, down over your face, through your heart center, luminous cleansing energy right throughout, stopping at your navel center. And take an inhale and exhale. We can do that one more time. So turning your palms up. Gathering again all the energy around you because energy is everywhere. We're energy. Every living thing has energy. Reaching. Again, imagining. Healing energy flowing through. And bringing one palm on top of the other, facing inwards across the crown of your head. Down your face, through your heart center, right to your navel center. You can gaze down at the floor, soften your eyes, and take an inhale and an exhale. And just release and shake it out a little and come back to. Whatever you're doing, what I like about the shower of light, the energy shower, is any time during the day you might feel depleted or tired, this is something you can do just one up. You can practice it for five minutes at a time, um, but it's something that is in your toolkit just to help you up for those times when you might be feeling a little low on energy. All right, so as Ann mentioned, today we're going to talk about Reiki, some miscellaneous background information, Reiki specifically for cancer, and then walk away, like I said, with some exercises. Ann is going to take this PowerPoint, put it in a PDF so that you'll have access to all the exercises. So again, um, I won't go through all this. We'll talk a little bit about what is Reiki, brief history, why do you even want Reiki, where it's being used, because that's interesting. I'll talk about what happens if you go to a Reiki provider, so that if you decide after this, you would like to experience hands-on Reiki, so what you can expect. And then we'll go through, as I said, some self-practices that I use every day. And um, hopefully you'll find at least one that you might want to use. So let's talk about what, what Reiki is. So that this was the shower of light. So you'll have something to follow. So what is Reiki? Um, Reiki is um, a Japanese practice 
and you'll see that the translation of Reiki is Ray is spiritual wisdom. He is life energy. Uh, you'll hear it as the energy of life, universal energy. So it's different for different translations, but this is the most common one. So the thought behind Reiki is that as we all probably learned in our sciences is that all living things are infused with energy, whether it's a person, an animal. Um, there's just energy all around us. And energy goes by different names. So yoga, we talk about prana, talk about chi. And there are different ways to help balance energy. So Reiki is just one of them. And I know some of you are participating in the Tai Chi classes. That's another way of moving energy. Acupuncture is a traditional Chinese medicine, which they use meridians to move energy. We do it when we meditate. We move energy with yoga. So there's uh, many different ways to uh, raise our energy flow and to release energy blocks. Um, the thing with any of these is you have to find what resonates with you. So um, like I said, I know some of you are taking the Tai Chi, practicing yoga, um, I'll be honest with you, I tried acupuncture and that was definitely not for me. I went several times and just did not feel anything resonated with me. So finding your complementary integrative way to, to move energy is really going to be very personal, personal to you. And as Anne said, uh, just a reminder that this is complementary to traditional medical treatment. It is not something that you would just use maybe for relaxation. I, I have had clients just come for simply relaxation. I know I have the, the person who taught me through my different levels of Reiki. Um, a lot of times I will go to her for relaxation. So you can um, use it in different ways, but it is not our medical treatment. And um, it just helps us a holistic way of um, taking care of ourselves, having compassion for ourselves. So here's um, just a brief background on Reiki and some interesting things that are going on in the Reiki world. So Dr. Makawi Usai was the founder of the Reiki healing system. He actually went to this Mount Karama to meditate and fast. And during that time, he had what he said was a powerful shock and expressed it as he just felt energy going all through him. And the quote I put there is, he felt great Reiki over his head. So he left his mountain and went and started using Reiki within just the general public family. And then in 1923, there was an earthquake and he actually went very public with using Reiki. He didn't have anything written down. He just practiced. And that's where Dr. Chachuriai Hayashi comes into the picture because Dr. Usai asked him if he would help to make this more formalized. And that's exactly what he did. He opened up a Reiki clinic. He created tools and techniques and training manuals. and he actually came up with, which you'll see later when we do some hands-on, some hand positions of places where 
it would benefit you for Reiki. So it was still very much um, in Japan and um, it came west with Mrs. Taikate and she brought it to Hawaii and the mainland and started using the training manuals and whatnot to train over here in the West. So it's interesting if you ask some people, they will say there are only two types of Reiki, Western Reiki and Japanese Reiki. When actually there are many different types, but they're all branches. They are really just branches from the original Usai. So you, you'll hear Usai Reiki, Jakidan Reiki. And I know I had some conversation with Ron. He is also trained in Jakida. There's Karuna, there's Tibetan. Uh, going back to what I said in the beginning, I think it doesn't matter which one you find that may be something you want to follow and practice. It goes back to the intention because it's all about energy. So the interesting thing right now that's going on with um, Reiki is more and more historical information is still being captured because during World War II, when the United States took over Japan, they did not allow any Eastern types of healing. So Reiki kind of went underground. The places that was being practiced was in the West in Hawaii, but even that kind of leveled off and went underground. So they are finding that there is more information coming out as Japan once again started practicing and finding their oral traditions to help formulate other ways of looking at Reiki and again, some of these branches. So I, as I said, I was trained in Usai and Jakidan and um, you'll go to a William Rand and he talks about fire walking. So um, just so you know that there are differences out there and more and more is coming to light. So I think that's pretty interesting that it is still um, evolving. So let's talk about why would you even want Reiki? Um, some use it as a healing system, but it is also extremely effective for promoting relaxation. You'll see all of the different reasons why someone might want Reiki, de decreasing stress and anxiety. I'll talk a little bit about some of the studies that you can find out on the National Institute libraries. It's been studied for people with high blood pressure, people with breast cancer. So there's a lot of different ways that it has been studied. And one of the things I think that's important for us is it it promotes relaxation and decreases stress and anxiety. Some people have found that it's been useful for them for pain, um, going through chemo and um, just in general, it brings a holistic approach of balancing our energy, increasing energy so that we have a good flow of energy going through us. It really promotes for me um, a sense of wholeness. That's, that's how I personally look at it. Let's talk specifically about Reiki and cancer. So one of the things that's important in understanding Reiki is understanding the difference between curing and healing. So when you think of curing, it's eradicating the physical illness. And one of the examples, I also teach people how to 
um, become Reiki practitioners. One of the examples that I use is if someone has breast cancer, they have a mass, may have a mastectomy, chemo, radiation, and after a certain amount of time, they are deemed cure. But there's all this other stuff going on. There's the emotional impacts to it. There's the fatigue. There's the anxiety. So all of those things are something that Reiki can help in the healing aspect of it. Because as we saw, it helps with relaxation. It helps with reducing stress. And we know because we, most of us on here are cancer patients that stress can really impact our immune system. So that's some of the benefits for us as cancer patients. It can alleviate some of our symptoms. So I had a woman that I worked with who actually was a breast cancer patient who just had extreme, she was nauseated from the treatments. So she would come the week before treatment and then she'd have her treatment, that whole week would go by and she'd come again. Um, everyone is gonna be different in how they want to either practice their own energy work or go to an actual Reiki practitioner. For us, and I'll talk about me specifically, uh, fatigue. I was really struggling with fatigue and practicing self-Reiki and then going to my Reiki practitioner helped me to get into that deeper level of relaxation to where I, you can kind of just rejuvenate. And when your body goes to that level, which is very similar to yoga nidra for those that have listened to the yoga nidras, your body goes into that state of such relaxation that it's no longer in the fight or flight. It's in that place of calmness. And when you're in that place of calmness, your, anxi your anxiety decreases, your stress decreases, and your body can just rest and rejuvenate. So for me, it was really important through my treatment. I, I had, I went through BNR in 2019. The other places it can help is quality of sleep. So some of the energy exercises that we'll walk through might be useful to help you calm down. That energy shower, the shower of light, I love that one for just like, oh, bringing myself right to a, to, a calmness. So hopefully you will find something here as we go through. And then it promotes relaxation as we talked about. So my story was, as I mentioned, I had sleep difficulties because um, I was on steroids during the treatments. So I had excess energy for a few days, nothing hurt on my body, no, none of my arthritis or anything, but I had excess energy. And I call it the red cheeks because for me, steroids make my face beat red and I feel like I'm going to spontaneously combust. So Reiki was very important to me during that time. I currently also now go for IVIG every five weeks and I have to have steroids because I don't react well to the IVIG. So I have actually been going to my Reiki practitioner just before I get a treatment and um, then doing self-Reiki, self-energy work after. I also, during treatment, had anxiety every time it was time to go for treatment. I think I got rescheduled probably six times due to low counts. So they couldn't do the treatment and 
you know, the first time that was kind of like, oh, okay. Second time, ooh, getting a little nervous. And then by about the fourth time, I mean, I just dreaded going. I was so anxious. So energy work also helped with that so that I could keep my anxiety in check because you can't really change whether your blood counts are going to be up or down. Um, but at least it helped me. And then stress, I only speak for myself, but I think the first year I was diagnosed and even during treatment, I just did not have the knowledge that I have now about Waldenstrom's. I didn't understand the first year, like, aren't they treating me? I think many of us, when you're new to it, and then my treatment started just before COVID. And then because it got canceled and rescheduled so much, it was a good chunk of it was through COVID. So that was stressful because now no one could come in the room with you. Um, you had to wear a mask. So for me, I was anxious because of the rescheduling. I was stressed because just didn't understand enough about Walton Storms. And energy work, Reiki was really very key to me during my whole treatment time and after. And um, as I said, I've worked with many cancer patients and each person uses it differently. Some people just use it, as I said, for relaxation. But if you're relaxing, your stress levels are going down and um, you might not realize it, but saying you're going for relaxation is just fine. How often people go, so as I said, one woman, she would come every other week. I had a gentleman who only came once a month. I kind of look at it like a massage. Um, for me, I feel great for a couple of days. I have some back and hip things going on. And then it starts to get irritated and I go for a massage again. And I think that's what's so wonderful about energy work, and especially if you use Reiki, any kind of energy work on yourself that you can maintain throughout your daily life to keep that energy up. So what do we have next? So where is Reiki being used? Because uh, this is a cancer-focused discussion, I found and offered some places, as you can see below, Mayo, John Hopkins, Yale, Hartford, and um, different, so they all have it, as you can see. In Mayo Clinic, it's in a specialty group. In um, John Hopkins, they actually offer training to their medical staff. So some of the, the nurses may use Reiki with the patients themselves. I know in our local hospital here, Albany Med, um, which was a place I was going to go work and then COVID came, um, they actually have Reiki practitioners, volunteers, that they have a whole unit of Reiki, practitioners, massage, other energy work. So if you are interested, you can check it out in your cancer center or if you go to a hospital. And these are just some of the words you might see, integrative medicine, supportive service, cancer care, that, that, that's how you would look it up. Um, there's things out on Google that it will say these are the top hospitals that have it, but then when you research in, you find that they don't have it or they used to have it. So that, that could be another way to get an actual Reiki treatment by a Reiki practitioner. But as you can see, 
in this blurb here that some hospitals are using it for people that are having surgery. They have found that the Reiki treatment before surgery, again, helps with that relaxation, being calm. And after surgery, it also helps with any anxiety they may have from that. If you want to look up some studies, you'll see that it's been very successful with cardiac patients, and that's simply to reduce their stress and their high blood pressure. There are some cancer patient studies out there. There's not a, a lot, but they are out there. And then people who are experiencing post-traumatic stress syndrome. So if you look into what's being offered now to our service people when they come home from wherever they may be, Afghanistan, um, they're offering yoga, Reiki, are two things that you'll find our military has recognized that is very beneficial to um, post-traumatic stress. And as I said, you can, if you want more information, you can just go out to uh, NIH research. And uh, when you get in there, you just put the word Google in, in this, uh, put the word Reiki in the search, and I'll bring up some of the studies that um, have been done uh, Reiki specifically with different illnesses. Okay. All right, I said I would let you know what happens if you actually go to a Reiki practitioner. This is me. Um, practicing one of my clients. And usually you will be laying down um, on a massage table is typically what you find in a Reiki practice. And you have a discussion with the practitioner of what, what the reason might be for, for you to go there and what to expect. So what to expect when you are receiving a treatment is, um, as I said, you'll probably be laying on a table. They may or may not offer some essential oils to um, help with um, calmness. So I have lavender right here. If people want it, I use it. I always start mine out with a short meditation just to help them start to relax. If they've never had a session before, it's a little, you know, nerve wracking because even though we talk about what to expect, you, you just really don't know. And I will be honest with you, I have been going to, as I said, the person that trained me since 2013. And when I get on that table, I can feel my heart just pounding. I, I don't know why it goes away. She does a short meditation and that helps. So if you do decide to go to someone and you're feeling anxious, you could ask them to maybe just help you with some breathing exercise or short meditation. I think it's important to understand in Reiki energy work, you're not receiving the Reiki from us. We are really just the conduit, the vessel for the flow of Reiki. So if you are a practice a practitioner in Usai, there are certain steps that we do to be prepared to offer Reiki. And one of those is asking that the flow of energy from around us flows through us so that we can better help and support the person that we are working with. Usai Reiki, you'll see, is done in two different ways. Um, some have their hands just above the person, and some, which is how I practice, 
are just gently placed in certain places. So if you see down in this picture here, you'll see my hands are on the crown of this person's head. And there'll be different places that that to um, offer the flow of Reiki. And you'll you will talk with your practitioner what is and isn't comfortable for you. And then many times the client falls asleep. So after I typically have my heart pounding when I go for mine and I calm down, I, I am one of those people that often fall asleep and that's fine. Um, Reiki and energy work is going to happen whether you're asleep or you're awake. Um, some people may feel like warm spots. I have been told that my hands get very, very warm when I offer Reiki and they can feel that. Um, my hands do not feel warm to me, so it's always interesting when someone says that to me. Other people might actually feel cool or um, cold, so usually have blankets available. Um, the experience is different for everyone. So it's, um, and it's not only different for each person, it's different with each treatment. So one treatment you may go and I, I honestly, I've sometimes thought, well, nothing happened. I didn't feel a thing, didn't fall asleep, didn't feel anything. It's important that in any type of energy work, you know, we understand that the energy is still moving. And one of the goals of this, as I said, is to increase our flow of energy because it can become blocked. So as going back to acupuncture, that's sometimes what they work on is unblocking any energy areas. And that's one of the things as Reiki practitioners, we also do is to get that energy smoothly flowing through your entire being. So that is what you would experience if you went for a um, Reiki practice. And as I said, there's many different kinds. This is how I was trained and this is Usai Reiki. Okay. And do you want to open it up before we do any self treatments to see if there's any questions or? Um, I think we can plunge ahead and do some exercises. And if you guys have questions, you can begin to type them into the chat. We have had some nice comments in the chat about um, other folks who have either experienced Reiki themselves firsthand or are, are Reiki practitioners themselves using self-Reiki. So we can kind of touch on those um, at the end as well. But I think plunging ahead, I think we're really excited to get some exercises. Sharon, thank you. Okay, great. All right, well, the first one I am going to do is the palm exercise. So what is this about? This is really just trying to make your hands sensitive to energy in your hands and hopefully become aware of energy in your hands. And I'm going to start right out that said you may not feel anything when we do this exercise. You may not feel it five times from now. But if you keep practicing, you will hopefully feel the energy. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean that it's not there. So I, when I have a client, I actually do this just before I have them come, especially rubbing your palms. Our palms are very sensitive in many ways, not only uh, for energy points, but also uh, if you practice yoga, there are chakra points in the palms of our hands. So let's um, try to do some energy um, work here. Let's start by coming to quiet. Let's take a deep inhale. 
And exhale. Inhale. And exhale. Let's start by just rubbing your hands together. So rub them and we'll get the instructions on this, you know, for 15, maybe 30 seconds. I go until I can feel some warmth gathering in my palms. And then we'll stop and with your palms facing each other, keep your elbows close to your side, bring them out about 12 inches. and then slowly bring your palms together. Steam this a little here. Notice if you feel anything. You might have some energy just from the rubbing and then bring them out to the 12 inches. Notice if you feel anything here and bring them back. Sometimes that just helps if you um, are comfortable closing your eyes, close your eyes or just softly gaze down. Let your attention go straight to your hands. As I said, you might not feel anything. You might feel some warmth or some tingling, maybe some pulsating. And then we'll release that, shake it out, and then we'll do it again. So just kind of keep in the back of your mind, did you feel anything? And we'll try it again. So let's come to that quiet place. Taking an inhale. And exhale. Inhale. And exhale and start rubbing. Let your full attention go to your palms, feeling the heat you're generating, knowing that the energy is there. You just have to become attuned to it and then release, bringing your arms to your side, coming out those 12 inches and then letting your palms come in. Bring them back out. And back in. Hold here. Then bring complete awareness to your hands. And release. So it's um Maybe by a thumbs up or down, did anybody feel any sensations? Excellent. If you will decide you want to keep practicing this, um, try to imagine after you practice a couple times, try to imagine that you feel something. And then do it again without imagining. So you can flip back and forth by imagining that you're feeling it and then not imagining. But if you practice it over time, you will, most people do start to feel something. But I, again, I'll go back to myself and I'll be interested to talk to um, some of the other energy people, workers on, on the call, because I know I definitely have my times when even practicing with a client. I'm like, is anything coming through? I know it's coming through because I firmly believe in what I'm doing, but there are just those times so that this is a great way to get energy flowing and um, becoming aware, especially if you're going to do the self-treatments, it's nice to have that awareness. So I am going to share my screen one more time before we go on to the next there we go. So if you are going to go forward and do some of your own 
self energy work. There's a couple of things I think that will help you. And it is something that I do um, before I do my own work. And certainly, as I said, with Usai, there are certain things as practitioners we do, and this is um, some of it. So the first thing is coming to quiet, coming to um, a short meditative state. And some ways to help you get there are maybe just some little gentle movement. And if you're just sitting on a chair, it might be just rolling your shoulders, just some movement to um, help you release any tension. And then I do several rounds of breath work. So I gave you a couple of examples there, taking some deep inhales and exhales going through several rounds of that, or just watching your inhale and exhale, because that's a way also just to focus your mind if you're watching the flow of your breath in and out. You may have other ways that help you come to quiet. Those are just a couple suggestions. And then the next thing is requesting the flow of Reiki or energy and how do you request that? So the request can be just a request. What I learned, I learned that you can use guides, spirits. Some people use angels. Um, you can request to the universe. Goes back to that intention. You can just ask for the flow of Reiki and with intention, it will flow. And then as you begin your own self-practice, just allow your intuition to be your guide. I will show you some set hand positions, but if you feel you don't want to go through all of the steps, and then you go with your hands. There's no predetermined process. When we learn as practitioners, we do learn process, but as you practice more and more, we use our intuition in working with our clients. So that, that holds true for self-reiki, self-energy work. And then just some little tip it, tidbits that I've learned over time is just like when we're doing yoga or meditation, all of a sudden you're going to be writing a grocery list in your head. And all you need to do is the same things, other tools, you just refocus. I always refocus on my breath. And in my mind, I was like, inhale, exhale, because then it just stops all of those thoughts. Or you can refocus on your intention. But just know this is going to happen. Um, I think even as a practitioner, there have been times when all of a sudden I'm like, oh, my gosh. And doesn't happen. It happened when I first started practicing. It was more like, is this working? Am I helping? Um, but as you do your self-practice initially, your mind might flit around. Um, be aware of any sensations. So we talked about that in the palm exercise. So start to be aware if you self-practice, are you feeling warmth anywhere? Or are you having any pulsations? I know when I work with people, many of them see colors. They see colors and then, you know, we talk about that or some people get emotional. So Become aware of what's going on after you do your self-practice or if you go to a Reiki practitioner. And then this is uh, repeating what I said before. Reiki is going to flow no matter where you put your hands. If your intention is there, it's flowing even if you think it's not flowing. And Reiki will never deplete your energy. It should increase your energy. So those are just some little things that I've learned through my time 
as a practitioner, but also doing self reiki All right, I think oh, this is the Reiki principles. So um, this was actually written by Dr. Usai. And I think many Reiki practitioners, no matter what discipline, still use these. I use these as um, at that point when I am getting ready, when I'm coming to quiet, I will end with this. And the Reiki principles are just for today. I will not be angry. I will not worry. I will be grateful. I will do my work honestly, and I will be kind to every living thing. Um, he captured these as a way to help the students with their personal and spiritual growth. As you go out and Google, you'll see pretty much the same, the same um, meanings, but you might see the words a little differently. So it's, um, again, translation and maybe what has happened in another um, branch of, of um, Reiki. So I think I can stop sharing now because we are going to do something called shaking the bones. So what I'd like to do is actually bring ourselves to quiet, have you ask for the Reiki flow, and then um, we'll begin. So I want to show you what it is first. And you can do this seated. And this is kind of like the energy shower, the shower of light. You can do it any time. And you probably have done it just dancing around your house. Please. Um, I sometimes will do it with music. So you'll come to standing or sitting. And again, it's called shaking the bones. I let my head drop down first. And then you literally just start shaking. So what you're doing here is moving energy. You're moving it all around. And because you're usually at home, bring your whole face into it. Open your mouth. Ah, ah. And you can do this as long as you want, as short a time as you want. But yeah, see, you almost like don't want to stop. Okay, Boris is looking at us. I know he's saying all oh, you people are crazy. <laughs> the beauty of this one is you can do it seated. So if I know many have neuropathy and standing up to shake bones is not really an option. So just sit in your chair. If you can, like tap your feet and that doesn't bother you. If it bothers you, you can just around in your chair like this and you should feel the energy flowing through can you feel it or not feel it excellent so that's another really easy one you can throw in during the course of your day especially as you no know, going back to and i'll talk personally about me I can go weeks and feel really strong. And then I have had two weeks where I'm hitting a wall like every day. I'm just exhausted. Um, so those are two of the ones I use, the shower of light and shaking my bones. There we go. All right. This next one is called draining the pain. Another great one for self. Um, energy work. So they say draining the pain, but I actually use it also when um, I'm going for my IVIG, because as I mentioned, I have a reaction to the IVIG itself and then the steroids. And so uh, I try to use that. But it is also useful if you are experiencing any pain. It doesn't even have to be Walton Strong's related. You know, use it myself again. 
um, I am having some hip trouble. So I have been draining my pain. So what does that mean? You can do it standing or seated. And I'm going to stand up so you can see what I'm doing. Um, I actually do it seated because, yeah, seated just because it's more comfortable. So as I said, I have been having hip pain. You take your left hand and put it where the area of pain is. When I use it, when I'm anxious, say for IVIG, I put my hands all over heart center. And you imagine, and then your right hand just points towards the floor. So what we're going to be doing is we are going to be imagining that pain going into our left hand, flowing through out our right into the earth. So when it's pain for me, I have to have visuals. I imagine a little red angry ball that's kind of pulsating. So that's what I've been imagining for my hip. So placing your hand on your hip, coming to quiet. for your intention, for Reiki to flow, energy to flow. And then as I inhale, I see the angry little red ball at my hip. I see it flowing through down my right arm, and then I see it being dumped into the earth. Inhale, going through my left, through my body, releasing out of my right hand. Do that one more time. Inhale, wherever your pain may be. And exhale. And release. And then, as I said, for me, uh, anxiety, put hand at heart center, right hand goes down. For anxiety, I just see a bunch of mumbled characters. Right at heart center, taking the inhale into heart center, seeing my anxiety floating through and down my right arm. Inhale into heart center. Seeing that little mask of characters floating down and out. And you can do this as many times as you would like. Um, I usually will do five to 10 visualizations. You can do it as many times as you want during the day. It's recommended if you have something chronic or even acute that you do it every day. I've been working with this every day with my hip. And, um, you know, like I said, you always go back to the curing versus healing. So I'm using traditional medicine, working with an orthopedic, and that. Hopefully they can cure this, but, you know, we'll see. Um, but the healing part is helping me relax, helping me visualize that the pain is moving out. So, um, again, it's a personal, personal process for us all. All right. I am going to share one more time but then I will come right off. This is if another way to do self-treatment. Most energy workers, Reiki practitioners, we do follow this somewhat when you're doing your own self-treatment. But again, it does not have to be in this order. If so I know I'm working with my hip and other than some of the other ones that we just walked through, 
I may start out with my hands at my eyes, but then move to my hip. But this is a process that you can follow. So you are actually moving energy throughout your whole body. So let's just uh, flip out of here again. So let's just um, come to quiet and take some deep inhales and exhales together. Let's take a deep inhale. And exhale. Inhale. And exhale. Do one more inhale. And exhale. And I like to bring my hands to heart center. Asking for the flow of Reiki energy. Move through me. That I, I actually say so I might better support myself and others. So setting that intention. And as you're ready, release your hands and just bring your palms to your eyes. And this is when you will begin to notice whether you're feeling any sensations. And bringing your hands to the top of your head, the crown of your head. And I'll go back to if it's not comfortable because you have a port or any issues, shoulder issues. Bring your hands back to heart center and just imagine that your hands are placed there. And always come back to heart center. And we'll just go one more place for the purposes of just practicing this exercise. And that's your throat center. So a hand placed here and here. Just noticing what you're feeling. And bring your hands back to heart center. At the end of any energy treatment, just thank however you want to word it, universal energy, Reiki energy, for flowing through. And you can release. So as I said, all of these hand movements will be in um, the PowerPoint so that you can practice. It's a it's really a lovely practice, you know. A lot of what we've been doing are just short things you can do if you need to boost your energy right away, but the actual hands-on is a wonderful practice just so you become in tune with yourself and that you bring that flow of energy through you. And the very last one, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, is um, energy tapping. And this is also an ancient practice to move energy around. 
And there are so many ways to do this. Just telling you, go out and Google. There's like people, you know, offer just practicing on your face, um, all different places. This is kind of a full body one. So I'll just show you the different areas that you can tap, but how to tap is important because you don't want to be beating yourself up. You can do this standing or seated. I like to do it seated, but I'll stand here and decide how you want to tap. Are you going to be using your fingertips or you can make really soft fists? And with this one, you start at your navel center because this one is the belief that everything starts. This is your strongest um, area for uh, energy in this practice. And you just lightly tap. So I like to use my fingertips. But I know a lot of people like the light fists. And then you just move clockwise around your belly. We'll do a little quick one here. Then you move up to your chest area. So definitely get that heart center. Tapping all around. Then you're going to be moving to your arm. And move up the arm. One set your hand and then back down. And then you go over to the opposite side. And then you do your neck and shoulders. I said we're going pretty fast here. The back of the head, the crown, sides. I find that tapping, like the hand positions, are just meditative in themselves back down to the chest and then we'll stop here because you'll be going down your legs and back up your legs. Again, it's there's multiple tapping techniques. This is the one that I use. Um, it can be a quick one. You can decide not to do your whole body. Then I would just focus on this area here in my head. Um, but it takes about 15 minutes. And if it's something that you want to try, you'll find over time it is very, very meditative. So I think that is everything that I have other than questions. You'll see when you get the packet, my email address is on there. My phone number is also on there. And I would love if you have any questions or any interest and going further, give me a call. Oh my gosh, Sharon, I feel so different from when we started our session. I feel really relaxed. Thank you for sharing all of those tools. And I had a couple questions coming into the chat. Feel free to type your questions if you have them. Um, Irene had written, how do we find a good Reiki therapist? And how much is a typical session and how long? does the session last? So just a reminder to stay muted for this period, we're still recording. Um, she wants to know some, it sounds like she's really interested in doing this. Um, not sure where you live, but you might wanna try one of the hospitals or cancer centers. Otherwise, um, there is, uh, I'll send it to you and so that it can go out with the package. There is a directory for Reiki practitioners in, I think it's just the United States, because I think Ron had a different one. And um, that will give you a list of Reiki practitioners in your area. If you still can't find one, call me and I'll help you try to find one. And then for cost, um, typically it is, what they do in most areas, it's whatever you would pay for it for a massage is what you can kind of figure it's going to be for a Reiki session of an hour. So I do half hour sessions, 45 minute sessions and hour sessions. 
but that that's how you can kind of gauge what the price is going to be. Got you. Thank you so much. Um, we had some back and forth about peripheral neuropathy and exercises for peripheral neuropathy. Is there anything you would suggest um, for this? Uh, I know that we have another practitioner here who has had some success doing things a certain way, but I wanted to open that up to you, Sharon, as well, since people seem to be interested in that particular topic. Yeah. So I thankfully do not have that. Um, however, my husband does. And when I work with him, and this goes, I, I work with him, and it, this would be self-treatment also, I pretty much go right to the area of his legs, knees, and down, and that's where I let my focus be. And that's why when you work with a Reiki practitioner, um, they may not go through all the different positions, because if you're there for a specific reason, then um, that's what you would want your practitioner to work on. So those are some of the things that I do. Like I said, um, different scenario, but the whole hip issue I'm having, I literally go right to my hip in most of my current sessions with myself. And, okay. and you know, shaking of the bones and um, anything can be done seated. So you would want to do low seated. And depending on the degree of your neuropathy, um, again, I know my husband can light, lightly tap his heels. Some days he can't. So it's just the moving around in the chair. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we had done uh, the practice where we're going through the body, or actually just cupping. Or, you know, going that little practice that you had shown with the, the daily self-treatment. Yep. How long would that be a practice, do you think, would be your regular, your recommendation for doing that if you were going to do that every day? So it's kind of interesting because what you'll learn over time is that you'll become more focused. In the beginning, I would plan at least a half hour because you have to calm yourself, come to quiet, I call it, coming to quiet meditation um, is really basically what you're doing. Um, then, you know, asking for your intention and then moving through. So I know when I first learned, I had to have my sheet right there to see where I was going because I did want to practice the whole body in the beginning because I wanted it. I, I would strongly suggest that in the beginning you do go through the whole practice because that's going to help you with feeling sensations. So maybe you don't feel anything here, but now you're coming here and you're noticing like what well, feels a little warm or tingly. So I would highly recommend when you're first starting to actually go through all these hand positions and it, it would take at least a half hour if you're really bringing awareness to it. But the interesting thing is sometimes it feels good just to take a really long practice and let your hands just be there. And sometimes some of my practices on myself can be up to an hour. But that wow. is how I would start. That's how I start out, and I would highly recommend it. So you get to know your body a little better. Oh. We had a couple questions about distance Reiki and then a question about insurance payments. Before we go there, I just had a question. Is there a reason why the left hand during drain the pain, the left hand is on the pain spot and the right hand is pointing down towards the earth? Is there a reason for left, right there? Because it's the cooling and our hot side. So it's, uh, yeah, that's why this is left is more of your cooling side. So you will want that pain to come in cool and you don't want to bring heat in when you're trying to get rid of, as we think of pain, it's usually like a heat thing. 
Yep. Gotcha. That makes total sense to me as, you know, kind of mirrors some of the, some of the thinking in yoga philosophy. And there's yeah. a lot of um, Qigong overlap that we are seeing with the tapping. Someone commented on that. Um, so how does distance Reiki work? And then that might be what you actually want to do something. So maybe before you answer that, what about insurance payments? I mean, we would really love to be able to have insurance yeah. coverage through a yeah. cancer center. It really depends on your plan. So I have one client that her plan has almost like a little charge card for integrative type services and Reiki is one of them. Whereas I have other clients where they do not have any specific insurance coverage for it. You could check your FSA if you have an FSA or an HSA plan. Um, but uh, it is those ones that might have the integrative coverage. And if if Reiki is included, you'll find that acupuncture is now included in most of them, acupressure. So it's getting there because it's all those things are energy work. But you will definitely run into people that think it's hocus pocus. We're working on getting all of these complementary and integrative therapies to be covered by insurance. And, yep. you know, more and more research that is out there only helps that. So thank you for answering that. Um, just really briefly, that left-handed, right-handed thing. If you're left-handed, is the left hand still your cooling hand? I would imagine it is. It, it, it is. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, if anybody else had any other questions, I think. Distant Reiki. So distant Reiki is um, you, you would be at your home. And again, you can lie down. You can be seated in a chair. When I've done distant Reiki, usually they're lying in bed or on you know, a recliner. And you, I go through the same type of setup that I do if someone is in my practice. We do the breathing, we do the short meditation, and the only thing that's not happening is my hands are not on you. But the time that we are working together, I am sending and asking Reiki to flow through me to you. And I've had success with my distant Reiki people that I've worked with. Yes, and I will attest to this as well. Sharon one time helps me with my father who was having a really rough patch. And um, I actually sent her a little picture of him. He was lying in bed with his little bucket for <laughs> nausea next to him. And um, she said she would send some distance Reiki to him with his permission. And he gave me a thumbs up on that. And then later in the day, I received a text from him. I don't know how, I because he's, you know, not somebody who really goes for this type of stuff, but I don't know how, but I feel slightly better. So, you know, who knows, but that was a really, I thought that was a really positive. Um, that is what actually made me want to do this webinar, Sharon, was that little thing you offered. So I'm so thankful for you. Um, and, and, you know, I think Sharon is open to sharing her distance Reiki with anybody who, um, you know, she'll have all of her information for us as well. So I think, um, I don't see any other questions. Yes, I don't see any other questions. So I think maybe if you, what we were going to do is a, a little meditation to end our session and then we'll stop our recording and we can have any other discussion. Um, you know, and if you, if you wanted to be on camera and have a interactive discussion, that will be on the non-recorded and folks, you're welcome to stick around and chat more. There's so much, so much content here. Um, and we want to give a chance to hear from maybe some of the other practitioners, um, who might have things to share. Does that sound good, Sharon? Um, I am going to, with this short meditation, send some distant Reiki. If you do not want to have the Reiki come your way, you can go into the chat and 
send it directly to me. But otherwise, I will send distant Reiki to everyone. I'm just going to, while you're, um, while everyone is getting settled, I'll just come in here and see if anybody has any concerns. Okay. So before we get started, just get comfortable in your seat. So maybe do a little movement because we have been up and down. And either soften your eyes, gazing down, or close your eyes if you're comfortable. And take a deep inhale. And as you exhale, let it out with a soft sigh. <sighs> inhale. Releasing with a sigh. Deep inhale and releasing with a sigh. <sighs> now coming back to your natural breath, your natural quiet breath. And as your breath flows, little by little, begin to withdraw from your thoughts. In your surroundings, focusing on the growing stillness and peace within. Inhaling quiet and peace, letting thoughts and mental, mental chatter dissolve into the background. In this place of inner stillness, take a few moments to become aware of any thoughts, tensions, or discomforts. Just becoming aware, nothing to change or do. Just acknowledge that they're there. Now imagine a cord extending from the soles of your feet, tethering you to the earth. The earth, that's place of stability, support, and nourishment. And begin to feel this connection becoming stronger and stronger. Take a full inhale. And as you exhale, imagine you're releasing those tensions or discomforts. Inhale. Releasing, letting them drift and fall into the earth. Inhale. And as you exhale, releasing. And now imagine a cord tethering you from the crown of your head to the sky, the heavens, the universe. And as you see this connection, it's becoming stronger and stronger. And as it becomes stronger, you see the universe pulsating with a white light of healing energy. And as you take an inhale, you see this healing white light filling your body. And as you exhale, it cascades through your entire being. Inhale, filling with white light. Exhale, flowing from the crown of your head to the tips of your toes. Take two inhales and exhales on your own. Seeing this healing white light.
And now for the next few moments, allowing complete stillness for your body and mind to deeply rest, rejuvenate, and receive the energy of Reiki. Feeling the light and healing energy of the universe blanketing you until you hear the sound of the chimes. Gradually becoming aware of your breath flowing in and out. As you begin to visualize the space around you, the walls, colors, notice if there's any sounds. And gently wiggle your fingers and toes. Movement bringing you back to this present moment, back into the space around you. Gently fluttering, open your eyes. And feel free to sign off and stay in this relaxed place. Or if you'd like to join Ann and I for any other discussion, feel free to stay on. for joining me today and allowing me to share with you the benefits and my love of Reiki. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was wonderful.